Hello and welcome to Dig School, cross-curricular learning themed around archaeology. This session is Pits in Places, where we'll be learning how to make the most of test pit finds by knowing where they came from. Key questions will be, how can knowing about the places where test pit finds came from help us interpret those finds? And what can those finds tell us about the places they came from? And why does this matter? So you've excavated a test pit, you've got your finds, you've identified them and dated them and thought about what they're telling you and about how things changed over the past. Now you need to think about how that story relates to the place that the finds came from. So we'll have a look at one genuine collection of finds from a test pit excavation. So I'll talk you through the finds and in your workbook, write down what the evidence is telling us about three key periods, Bronze Age, Late Saxon period, and the High Medieval. And there are four categories of evidence that I'll talk you through, the pottery, the animal bone, flint, and the other finds. So in your workbook, you've got a grid and you can write all of these notes down. So the first category of finds we had was the pottery, um, always uh, quite, well, usually quite common in test pits and always informative. Uh, so in this, we can see why the finds from this test pit fall into three main chronological groups, because there's Bronze Age pottery that you can see outlined in red here. Now that's only come from the bottom two contexts, context nine and context 10, 90 and 100 centimetres below the surface. And in fact, from context 10, there's no pottery of any more recent date. So that suggests that right at the bottom of the test pit there, there's an undisturbed layer of Bronze Age deposits with nothing later in them. So everything else from that layer almost certainly dates to that same period. The next period we've got is represented by just three sherds of pottery, two sherds of SN, St Neots were there, weighing just seven grams altogether, and one sherd of Stamford ware, S-T-A-M there, weighing just two grams. So they're two very small sherds. Um, and they're very far apart. So the uh, two sherds of St Neots ware right at the bottom there in context nine are mixed in with the Bronze Age pottery. And the one shirt of Stanford where up in context four, is actually mixed in with some later stuff that I'll talk about in a second. So it looks all very disturbed. There's only three shirts. They're very small. So that doesn't suggest there's a hugely important or densely inhabited site immediately at this location. But it does suggest there's something going on in the period between about 850 and 1100 AD, that there's something going on, probably for the Norman conquest, not too far away. And actually, the Stamford ware is above average quality pottery for that period, so it might be quite a, an important sort of site. And then the vast majority of the pottery dates to the high medieval period. And you can see in the date range column on the right hand side there, there's a whole series of contexts that uh, have a date range of between about 1100 to 1200. Um, that's context uh, eight and seven. And then we've got contexts which have a date range from 1100 up to about 1400. That's uh, context uh, six up to two. And then the final context dates from about 1150 up to possibly as late as 1550. But actually, that shared of LMT in the right-hand column, that's late medieval transitional wear, that could go as late as 1550, but it could be as early as 1400. So those four shards could be as early as 1400 or as late as 1550. But when we're looking at those other columns, the EMW, the early medieval wear, the HED, Headingham wear, um, the HG, the Hertfordshire grey wear, and they're all present in large numbers and in context where there's nothing much later as well. So that suggests we've got layers where we've got undisturbed medieval deposits where everything else in those layers is going to date to the medieval period unless it's grubbed up something a bit earlier, because 
there is that shed of Stanford Ware that might be a couple of hundred years earlier. Some interesting finds from there are the Surrey White Ware that you can see. There's seven sherds of that, and that again is above average quality pottery, suggests that there's something a little bit above average in terms of importance and uh, the wealth of the people there. So that's what the pottery is telling us about those three periods. You can then look at the animal bone, and here we've got that divided up by species running down and the context of the test pit are listed across the top of the columns there. So going through those three periods again, starting with the earliest first, that's the Bronze Age layers, or the layers with potentially Bronze Age pottery um, in them, outlined in red there. Context 11, below context 10, didn't have any Bronze Age pottery in it, but it's below it, so it must be either the same date or earlier than it. Um, and we can see there, there's, um, well, the context 9 and 10, there's a bit of cow bone, there's a bit of sheep bone, they're the most common domesticated animals found. Um, and then there's a few fragments of sheep-sized bone as well. So we can get some idea of uh, a farming community rearing sheep and cattle. The context that produced the Anglo-Saxon pottery, of course, wasn't much and they were very thinly spaced, so it's quite possible that none of this bone dates to that period at all. Um, the earlier stuff could be Bronze Age and the later stuff could be High Medieval. So we can't really say too much about that. But when we're looking at the High Medieval period, all that large numbers of contexts are dated to that period, uh, we can see there's quite a lot of animal bone appearing from those. There's the animals that were commonly reared, sheep, cow and pig reared for uh, their wool for the sheep, their uh, milk for the cow and also to pull plows, and the pig that was really just reared for meat. But we can also see some quite unusual bone as well. So there's um, well, there's some chicken, which is quite common by this time, but it's not native to Britain. And in fact, it only actually appears after the Roman period. So we can see there isn't any of that in the Bronze Age layers because they hadn't appeared in England at that time. And then there's some horse bone. Now, horses were valuable, expensive animals. Only the wealthier people had them. They're quite a status symbol. They're used for lords, for traveling around, um, for hunting, and sometimes in battle. So we have a hint of a slightly higher status sort of uh, tendency in the high medieval period from that horse bone, rather the same as that Surrey white ware hinted at a bit of higher status there. We've also got a bit of fish bone turning up right at the bottom, context six, we can see right in the bottom row there. Couldn't get the species of fish, um, but fish again could just be bought at market or caught in the local rivers. Um, but they could also come from a lord's private fish pond or from a moat, a sort of private area of water around a lord's house. And there's also teal. It's a wild duck, uh, probably quite a luxury as well. So another hint that whatever's going on here, they had a kind of above average diet and above average livestock with that horse. So then we've got the flint. Now the flint's quite strange really because there's some interesting bits, the secondary and tertiary flakes which are usually prehistoric because they've been struck several times which suggests someone's trying to make a flint tool rather than it's just an off cut from trying to face flint for a building. Um, and there's also a blade which is definitely a manufactured prehistoric uh, item. It's it's a blade probably used like a knife, a long, thin piece of flint. Um, but they're all coming from quite high levels, levels above um, most of that prehistoric pottery. So um, all of those flints are seen to be mixed up with later material. So probably in the same way that the uh, Saxon pottery has got moved up, perhaps from someone digging down at some point, uh, so it looks as the flint. There's also quite a lot of burnt flint as well, which suggests um, either prehistoric cooking, uh, brewing, or possibly cremation of body. Um, and actually, it's unusual to have as much pottery as we had from that, those lower contexts. In fact, the vast majority of test pits don't produce prehistoric pottery at all. Only about two in a hundred will produce any prehistoric pottery, so it's very uncommon. 
So it's just possible with that burnt flint and that blade that what we've got is a prehistoric settlement nearby, um, or possibly a cremation, given that we've got that um, burnt flint, and um, quite a few bits of it as well. And then we've got the other finds. So again, these are listed by context, starting with the oldest. We can see we've just got bits of charcoal and perhaps bits of shell, perhaps signs of fires. Um, into the medieval period, we've got quite a lot of oyster shell, um, very commonly eaten, usually freshwater oysters. Um, they're too far from the sea to be uh, uh, saltwater oysters. Uh, they go off quickly and things didn't move around quite as fast as they do today in the medieval period. We know these layers are medieval because we can date them from the pottery. Um, there's also some burnt wattle and daub. Now, daub's used for kind of... Um, plastering on the walls of timber framed houses. Um, that it's been burned suggests perhaps that timber building burnt down or perhaps it was near a fireplace or even perhaps used for an oven. So it suggests perhaps there's cooking going on in a perhaps out of detached kitchen. The really interesting find from this is the metal arrowhead, which you can see in context three under the metal column. Um, very, very uncommon. We've only found one or two of these in two or three thousand test pits that we've dug. So that's very uncommon. They're used again in hunting or warfare um, and usually suggest um, a, a high status elite site again. So that's just breaking all those finds down by those periods that we talked about before. So that's a summary. Now you've had a chance to write down what is going on in those three distinctive periods from each of the forms of evidence. So just take a few moments now to check you've got the key points of the story from each period. Remember that in the Bronze Age we've got an unusually large amount of pottery for the period and perhaps hints of burning, possibly a cremation, perhaps a settlement, Possibly both. In the Anglo-Saxon, late Saxon period, we've got very little pottery, but some slightly higher status stuff, suggesting there might be a higher status site not too far away. And then in the high medieval period, we've got a lot of pottery suggesting dense occupation. We've got finds of all different sorts from the bone and from the metal finds and from the pottery, suggesting it's an important site. And the sheer density of pottery also suggests there's been a lot going on there. So just check you've got all those points written down in your booklet. So what we're going to do now is think about where those finds came from, because this is about understanding finds from the test bit within the place that they come from. So this test bit, Mel 1329, um, is excavated in southern England. Uh, you can see the balloon marking spot there. Um, and you can see the place that it came from, the arrow points to the precise location where that test pit was excavated, and looking in really close up, that's the actual location of that precise test pit. Now we can look at that and see some evidence for what's going on there. So we can see the test pits in somewhere that is today a quite big village. Um, we can also see that the test pits are the very north end of that village. So it's in part of a village, but it looks like it's kind of on, on the edge of that village today. We can also see there's a stream, that's the River Mel, circulated, circled there. Um, so the test pit is on the edge of a stream. We can also see there's a church there, the parish church, but the whole parish that this village is in the middle of is also situated quite close to that test pit. We can also see there's a manor farm there with um, sort of antiquity style writing suggesting that's quite old. And there's also moats marked there. And in fact, we can see on the picture on the right hand side showing the detail of the, where the test pit is that actually it's in a moat. Now you can see that moat, it's a sort of lozenge shaped uh, feature shaded in grey. And moats are high status uh, ditched enclosures that in the um, 12th and 13th century, particularly 13th century, 
felt founders were very fashionable for lords to sort of dig around their residences. They showed them off nicely, reflected them in the water, they provided a bit of defence, uh, and they also provided somewhere to keep fish, so you've got a bit of fresh food um, conveniently close to your house. So we can see that we've got some evidence just looking at the landscape about where that pit was that helps us put the finds into their kind of give them more meaning. There's a hint from the finds at their higher status, but actually that moat also suggests its high status. And the fact that it's close to the church suggests that it might even be tied into uh, the high status site is close to the church. And of course that Bronze Age settlement has been on the edge of the river. And we can look at evidence from historic buildings. We've noticed that sort of antiquity style writing, um, but actually we look at the uh, listed buildings index and in fact the addresses at the bottom there, so you can look at that for anywhere that you might be digging a test bit in. Uh, we can look at the four closest uh, buildings to our test bit, which is marked with a red star here. Um, the one that the arrow is pointing to there is an early 16th century house, so from perhaps 1500 to 1550, um, just about perhaps the same date as that very last piece of late medieval transitional pottery. We can see that the other building is quite a lot later, mid 18th century, 1750s perhaps. It was a granary, it's been converted to a house now. Then we can see the parish church there. Well, the earliest building there dates to the middle 12th century, the 1150s perhaps. Uh, 50 years later, the nave and the west tower um, uh, are either added or rebuilt. In the 14th century, windows are added. And in the 15th century, uh, again, there's more work done extending the south aisle uh, and, and the porch. So we can see the period at which the church is being built and enlarged very much the same sort of date as the vast mass of that pottery from the test pit, which again, looking at those dates, is from the uh, 1100s, 1200s and 1300s, but with very little, much later. And then the last building is the mill there, dates to about 1740, extended in about 1840. So that's giving us a bit of historical context from the buildings. So we've looked at the landscape, we've looked at the buildings, and then we've got a bit of historical evidence as well. And uh, researchers who've looked at that have um, come up with the suggestion that the church may well be older than the earliest fabric, which if you remember was dating to the 12th century. Um, uh, the earliest documented date suggests about 970, but they're suggesting it could be earlier than that. And certainly, um, by the time you get to Doomsday Book in 1086, the church is in, recorded there, which is unusual, which suggests it's quite important. And it's a minster, which means it might have been one of the earliest churches to be built. Another reason why it might be dating before 970. Of course, we have hardly any pottery of that date from the test pit. But we did have that little bit, which suggested there might be something going on there. And then we've got some information about a couple of manorial sites there. So Topcliffe Manor is the one that's surrounded by the moat there. So that's the one our test pit was in the middle of. Um, it actually has a mill as well, um, although that mill is much later in date, the current building is much later. There's a mill listed in Doomsday as well, and it may well be that 18th century mill is on the same site as the Doomsday one 800 years before. And then there's another medieval moated site nearby as well, Vizis. Um, that again, we've got documentary evidence that the owners were granted permission to build a chapel, but actually the ruins of the house stood there until the 20th century, but are gone now. So we've got a bit of a feeling of several quite high status buildings all clustered in this very northern bit of the settlement there. So, just have a think now and note down how this question of putting the pit in its place actually helps us understand. Have a look back at your what's the story notes about what the finds were telling us. And then just note down your thoughts about what are the test pits finds from Meldreth telling us that we don't know 
and the landscape, the buildings and the history. And then turning the question the other way up, what are the landscape, the buildings and the written evidence tell us that we can't tell from the finds? So have a think about that. And if you want to spin the tape back to check your thoughts, you've got a chance to do that now. So make sure you've got those answers written down. And then in part two, we'll look at another way in which putting test bits in their place can help us understand. So part two of pits in place, we're going to look at a very, very different uh, historical question, also explored through finds from test pits. So the first question then is, what makes a good place for young children to play? Perhaps you want to have a few thoughts about what your ideas might be. There's some suggestions that people have come up with in the past. Perhaps you want to have a look at those and think, how many of those do you think important? Which do you think are the most important uh, for children? Which would you consider to be least important? Is there anything that's been missed out? If you're thinking about what makes a good place for young children to play. So people have thought about this a lot. Um, and in 1928, so that's nearly 100 years ago, um, work started designing a place, a, a settlement for people to live in, in America, in New Jersey, at a place called Radburn. And this specifically aimed to be a good place for children to live. They wanted to nurture healthy communities for five providing open communal spaces, community centres, play areas and shops. And they wanted to separate pedestrians, people walking around and children playing away from cars by facing the houses onto pedestrianised paths rather than facing the houses onto streets that cars could drive up. Now, all of this was really different from a lot of housing that was in uh, the UK and indeed in much of the Western world at that time, uh, where over the Victorian period, when there'd been a huge growth in the population, particularly in bigger cities, uh, housing had been tightly packed in. You can see some pictures here of what some of the streets looked like, none of those healthy spaces for people to play um, or people to move around in, no green spaces, very cramped accommodation, uh, quite dirty. So in the 1960s and 70s, in the period after the Second World War, a lot of this Victorian housing was pulled down. It was deemed to be not fit for human habitation and new estates were built. And many of them were based on Radburn inspired ideas. This idea of open space, um, pedestrianized layouts at a period, of course, when car use was growing hugely in the 1960s and 70s. And this particular layout, and you can see two pictures of it here um, from sort of opposite ends of the country, one in Scotland, one in England. Um, they had this layout where the front doors of houses open straight onto these pedestrianised green, grassy areas with footpaths leading up them uh, where cars couldn't go and where children could play out in the spaces conveniently close to their parents and carers' homes so that they could... Uh, play with other children while still close to their houses, but away from traffic. And by the time we get to 1979, this is described as a conventional and well-tried variant of Radburn housing. It's the very standard way of laying out houses, and it's, it's very widely used across the UK at this time. But it is challenged. Uh, by the time we get to the late 70s, um, people are starting to say, actually, it's a mad scheme. Open planned housing, streets are replaced by empty spaces, uh, the community and the individual are abolished, which doesn't sound good. Um, other commentators are saying that either something was wrong with the people or something was wrong with homes because people didn't like these sorts of estates. And this is a criticism that's applied to the sort of estates that uh, Radburn, those Radburn estates uh, were included in that category of these 1960s and 70s new housing estates. So the inquiry for you is to find out 
whether those pedestrianised communal Bradburn type greens of those 1960s housing estates, did they succeed actually in their aims of providing outdoor spaces for children to play safely with children from other families? Or did they fail to achieve those aims and become neglected, littered spaces that children shun and no one wanted? So you've got the two different things. You've got the aims of the Radburn planners inspired by Radburn in New Jersey, and then you've got the criticisms that were levelled at the whole layout. Which of those do we think is true? Well, we're going to look at one particular case study and you can have a look at the evidence and make up your minds uh, how that might answer your inquiry. So this is an estate in Lincolnshire in the centre of the country. Um, you can see a map of the uh, place it's in today, Gainsborough, um, which is just on the border between Lincolnshire and Nottinghamshire, very much in the middle of, middle of England. Um, you can see an aerial photograph of it. And it's very much one of these pedestrianised layouts. So you can see here, the, here's the estate. Um, and the green area is the area where there's no through roads. The uh, red dotted lines show the areas where traffic could actually go right through. Uh, the yellow dashed lines show areas that were dead ends just for cars to get access to garages. And the green area is all of the areas that's effectively covered by this uh, pedestrianised estate. And we dug not one, but lots of test bits across it. And here you can see the distribution of them. Uh, around half of them were on Radburn greens, those are the ones coloured green. Uh, some of them were in enclosed back gardens, those are the ones coloured brown. Others were in the school playground, those are the ones coloured red, which were sort of outside the pedestrianised area, but within the school playground. And then there are a couple that are actually on uh, grassy areas, but the, the weren't pedestrianised grassy areas that were close to roads. There you can see how those test bits fit over that aerial photograph, and you can see how those test bits are sitting over those green uh, Radburn greens, just like the one you can see in the picture there. So this is one of these test pits. Just have a look at this, have a look at the picture of the finds, and have a look at the list of the key finds there. I just note down whether you think any of the finds from that test bit suggests the green was used by children. What is that evidence? And what do you think children might have been doing there? So you've had a chance to note that down and perhaps you noticed the marbles. They're the two most obvious finds relating to children and of course they're listed in the key finds there. There's also a slightly less easy to see little plastic toy car wheel as well there. And those finds do suggest the green is used by children because marbles and cars are played with by children. So it's, there is a hint that there are children on that estate, on those areas, on those green spaces. But of course, there were lots of test pits dug there. So while the one test pit can tell us about that one particular space, with lots of them all on that same estate, you can look at the bigger picture. So now have a look at the finds from all of these test pits. And here they're listed, uh, grouped by where they were. So the test pits on those communal pedestrianised greens, uh, free from traffic, are the ones coloured green and are listed by number. Uh, the ones in the back gardens are coloured brown. The ones in the school are coloured red. And the ones on the uh, green spaces nearer the roads are coloured in blue. So mark on your map which test bits produce any evidence for children's toys. And these are bits of marbles or bits of um, other, other bits of uh, remains of toys, uh, plastic soldiers and so on. Have a look at them in a minute. Um, in the meantime, mark on your map where the toys were coming from. So you've had a chance to mark on your map where those toys were coming from, those fragments of toys. And make sure you note down as well how many toys came from each of those test pits. 
So looking at the map here, this is exactly the same area of the state. You can see the uh, test bits there, the same numbers as the actual test bit numbers there. Um, and here's an example of some of the finds. So there's marbles again, there are quite a lot of marbles. Um, but also things like toy plastic figures. There's a, a, a fireman and a soldier. There's a little plastic cat. There's a Smarties uh, lid. There's a Kinder Egg um, toy container as well. The sort of sweets uh, that are used by, that are most commonly eaten by children. Of course, the Kinder Egg a container contained a children's toy. So that's all stuff that we think quite confidently can be related to children. And in showing the distribution of them, what I'm going to do is the test bits have produced sort of below average numbers of finds. But some children's toys are shown in light colour. Above average is shown in dark colour. and Well above average is very dark. Again, using that same colour coding of green, brown, red and blue. So you should already have marked this up and you should have been able to see whether the red the greens are producing children's toys or not. So if they weren't used for children's play, you wouldn't expect them to be producing much in the way of toys relating to children's play. But of course, when we map those finds, we see that actually the vast majority of the toys are coming precisely from those Radburn greens from test bits that are coloured green. And in fact, we can see nearly all of the test bits on the greens are producing children's toys. Surprisingly, only one of the test bits in the school playgrounds produce any children's toys. Neither of the ones near the road, neither of the blue ones produce any children's toy finds. And the back gardens produced average um, or above average amounts, um, or in one case, actually produced no children's finds at all. The presence, therefore, of that many toys on that many test pits strongly suggests that those greens were used by children for play. We've got so many finds from there. But we can be really quite confident that children were using those greens for play. So your inquiry was, did the pedestrianised communal greens achieve their aims of providing outdoor safe play space for children? Or did they fail and become neglected, ignored spaces that children shunned and no one wanted? So take a few moments now to write your answer to that question and your evidence, the reason for why you've come down with the answer that you have. So you've had a chance to write down your answer and I think it seems fairly strong evidence that actually those pedestrianised greens did succeed in their aims of providing safe space for children to play because we've got the evidence of them spending time playing there. And in fact, the test bit data giving us other insights into this estate. So some of the other categories of finds, we've got a glass from the later 20th century, uh, 16th century pottery and medieval pottery. So take a few minutes now on your other maps to mark down where all those sorts of finds are coming from. So you now have a chance to look at other sorts of evidence. Now, the 20th century glass is an interesting sort of category of evidence to map, because that will also tell us something about whether people are looking after those Radburn greens properly. Are they throwing their rubbish away on it? Glass is the most durable sort of rubbish, or actually are they not? And have a think about what your mapping of the evidence has told you about that. And then here we can see the pattern and actually it's the complete opposite of the toys. Whereas all the toys were turning up on the Radburn greens, all those green test pits were showing up quite strongly there. In fact, for the glass, it's the complete opposite. The back gardens are producing more of it. Uh, one of the test pits on the edge of the road and some of the test pits in the school grounds as well. And in fact, the Radburn greens, those pedestrianised greens, 
remarkably little glass. That suggests they were well looked after and they weren't sort of areas of antisocial littering. So another category of find that tells us something about the longer term history of this estate. It's a great way of connecting people living on the estate with the history before the estate was built is the medieval pottery. So did you, looking at the data you've marked down, draw a circle where you think a medieval settlement might have been, where most of the pottery is coming from. So here's my map of that. And that's my suggestion of where the settlement is likely to be closer to. There's a whole uh, series of pits that are producing five, four, five, six sherds of pottery, which is quite a lot for the medieval period. Uh, so there may not be a settlement immediately there, but there's probably one quite nearby. We have no written evidence for this whatsoever. And then finally, there's a distinct category of 17th century pottery, um, which turned up in large amounts and slightly surprising, it's mostly drinking vessels and plates. It's not the sort of uh, ordinary storage vessels that turn up as much. There's much more in the way of this slightly posher stuff. You can see the yellow and brown stripy stuff. Uh, that's uh, sort of a food vessel or a display vessel, and the blue bit is a drinking cup. Um, so again, mark where you think the concentration of that was. Where's the most likely site there? And again, from looking at that evidence, you can see there's a cluster of pits in the middle there. Um, now, that could be a settlement of some sort, but we do actually know from the historical data there was a battle in the middle 1600s here as part of the English Civil War between uh, Charles I and Oliver Cromwell. Um, and we just suspect this may have been the encampment site. We didn't find any musket balls, so it suggests it wasn't actually part of the battle. But it looks maybe like it was the encampment where one of the armies camped out drinking and eating. So I hope that's given you two different sort, very different sorts of evidence, which answers that question about why put a pit in its place? Because if you interpret the test pit data in the light of where it comes from, it helps you tell more the story of the finds. It helps confirm perhaps evidence for high status. It helps you uh, tell that uh, that Bronze Age settlement, for example, was on the edge of a stream. It helps uh, you discover that that high status medieval site was close to the church. And the finds help us tell more of the story of the place. So uh, we have no idea of that prehistoric settlement without the archaeology. We didn't know the dates of the habitation of that high status site and the date at which it was abandoned without the archaeology. And certainly the finds from that post-war housing estate have given us some indication of the way that different sorts of people use the estate, and particularly those green spaces with children playing on them and people being careful about not throwing litter away on them. And knowing all of these sorts of things helps us protect the past. We know more about the archaeology that's there. We know there's an intact uh, Bronze Age habitation layer and indeed intact medieval layers in that uh, settlement at Meldrith that we looked at in part one. And it helps us appreciate what's around us. We can actually see more of the history of that 20th century estate, both in terms of children in the 20th century playing and in terms of that Civil War long ago encampment before a battle and that medieval settlement was completely lost to history. And of course, that also helps us build better from the future. For the future, we can protect sites if we know they're there. And perhaps we can even think that building housing estates today with space for children to play sociably with children from other families, but near their homes, might be a good way of building better places for people to live. So that's given some idea of how knowing about the places where test pits were can help us interpret the finds and how the finds can help us interpret those places and tell us something about why these things matter. I hope you've enjoyed this session of Dig School 
and I hope to see you again at another dig school in the future. Take care.